Thank you, Brother Tex. Go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm not going to lie, the best sermon you can probably hear is when just Scripture is read. So it's always a little hard to follow a Scripture reading because I can't outdo Paul. Right? Paul's word, God's word, is so much better. Um, but as we look at uh, Ephesians 5, right, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians. We're talking about this transformation of the Christian life. We're talking about when the gospel comes not just into the individual life, but into the corporate life of the church. Right? We as Americans, we tend to think very individualistically. Right? We, we think about one. Right? We think about me and my family. We don't think about the whole. We don't, we don't see a grander narrative of what God is doing. The, the Spirit could dwell not just with me. How audacious of me, by the way, to think that the Holy Spirit could only speak to me. As if I was some special uh, conduit of the Spirit. Rather, the Holy Spirit dwells with all of us, with each one of us who are members of the body, with each one of us who are saved. And so the book has been talking about this transformation of the Christian life, that as we come to know the Lord, we are transformed, we are changed, we cannot look the same any longer. And so this week we're going to be in 6 through 20. Uh, Now your Bible may end the paragraph with 21. Um, I grammatically take 21 to go with the next section kind of a weird English, it makes sense up, Greek, it makes sense down. So I'm going to go down with that one. So we're going to do um, verses 6 through 20. We're going to talk about what light does, right? When, when we are transformed, when we change, when we become imitators of God, what does this light do in us? What happens? So I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to start in verse 6. We'll go through 20, and then we will pray and get started. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments or empty words. For God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in fruitless works of darkness. But instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Pay attention then uh, uh, to know how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with, all your, or with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks Always, for everything, to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, you are the God of light. You are the God who rules all things. You rule the light and you rule the darkness. Darkness cannot hide from you. Darkness cannot overcome you. But your perfect light overcomes all. And so we ask that as we look at your word and as we consider what your light does in this transformation that you work in our hearts. I pray that you would um, speak mightily by your word, that you would open our hearts to you, that you would move by your spirit within us to change us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So uh, this, we're in the transformation, and how God does this transformation is through this image of light, right? And it's not that when you got saved, there was like a, a Damascus Road experience where a blinding light literally hits you, and you, you have scales on your eyes like the Apostle Paul, right? It, the gospel is described as light coming into our lives. And light is something that darkness cannot take over light. If you want to make a room dark, what do you have to do? You don't add more dark. We don't have switches in our house that are like, um, our, our electricians in the room don't install light switches and dark switches. You know what I mean? Like when it's bedtime, you don't flip the dark switch to make the room darker. What do you do? You remove the light. 
And if you want to make the room light, what do you do? You add light. You don't get rid of darkness. You add light. Light is something that we contribute, right? If, if we wanted to make this room dark, I would tell Joe to flip a bunch of switches back there, and it would get darker, but it would never quite hit dark. It would still be light. Why? Because the windows are open. Because my beautiful green clock is shining. Because the projector is pushing light, right? The light constantly overcomes dark in our lives. Um, if you want to drive safely at night, what do you add to your driving experience? You all did not say that quick enough. I am worried. I don't, at, at a certain hour, I hope not to run into you on the road. No, you add light, right? When you're looking for your keys in the middle of the night, or you, know, you wake up early for work and you're looking for your keys bumping around in the dark, what do you do to fix your problem? You stub your toe on four more things. No, you pull your cell phone out and you put just enough light to be able to find it without waking your spouse up, right? The light comes into darkness and darkness is submitted to the light. The stars are the perfect example of this. As far as the light can shine, it will shine. And there's perhaps no greater darkness than the vacuum of space. And yet we see stars that are light years away. That we could never possibly journey to those lights. You can see the city of Baltimore ever so faintly in the, in the distance. If you're just the right spot on a hill. Because that light can't be conquered. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Is when light comes into our midst, our darkness is exposed, but it's exposed for a purpose. And so we start here in verse 6, right, building off of verses one through, um, 1 through 5, which were to become imitators of God and have nothing to do with sinfulness in your life. And Paul writes in verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty arguments or empty words. Uh, these empty words, it seems to be not just that, um, you know, somebody brings a terrible argument and you just blow it off. This is speech, it's like we talked about last week, speech which is not oriented towards grace is empty. Speech that does not lead you to the Lord leads you away from the Lord. Speech that does not, arguments, words that are not intrinsically pushing you closer and closer towards the Lord are pulling you away. Because they can only go two directions, right? We as a Christian, we live a life that is oriented either to the Lord or against the Lord. We know that there's no middle ground. And so Paul warns, don't be deceived, right? Let no one deceive you of your empty arguments. Let no one come to you and say, this, this is okay. You should have a little darkness in you. It's okay to have just, just a little bit of your sinful flesh that you can just kind of save to the side, right? Th this isn't like when you're on a diet and you're hiding the Reese's cups in your closet, right? Um, th th this is something very different. And he says, why? For God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Don't become an accomplice to it. Don't allow these things in your life. Don't listen to a voice that leads you to sin. Don't listen to a voice that says, you can be angry on your own accord. You're justified. You should blow up on this person. You should go and do these things. This little lie that we're going to spread, it'll be good. It'll be lovely. It'll make us feel good. No, listen to none of that. Which, by the way, it's typically my own voice that tells me that, isn't it? Not many of us have a little minion in our life that's telling us how to sin. I can find sin. Good at it. I have a whole resume of, as a sinner of being good at it. I am such a good sinner, I needed God's Son to die on my behalf. I am at an elite level of sin. Professional, in fact. And instead, we are to run from that. Don't listen to those voices. And then he says in verse 7, let's get the positive. Therefore, do not become their partners. So we're not just given don't listen, but we're given don't be their partners. Be partners with something else. In verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. I love that we, we tend to think of our sin as something of an attribute, right? We think of this as something like, I have brown hair, I have 
you know, size 10 and a half feet. I'm about this tall. These are attributes, right? And there's many attributes that we can change. If, if I don't like my hair, I can change it, right? I can either dye it or I can shave it. I can fix that real quick, right? I can do things to change that. We think of our sin as an attribute. We think of the darkness in our life, the, our past sin life, we think of that as an attribute. That's something I stood parallel to. But we don't stand parallel next to our sin, we embody it. Just like when we become a Christian, we embody light. Your Christianity is not an attribute. Uh, uh, I deleted my social media, but one thing I hated on social media was the little, uh, the, it has like a little, what, a, a bio section, right? Where you write little things that, you know, are you male or female or confused or what are you, right? And um, in it, it says, what religion are you? Just lumped in with the rest. And we think of our Christianity as something that's just an attribute lumped in with the rest. I live in Carroll County, I work at this place, I'm a Christian, I have three kids, right? We think of it as just another piece of who we are, as though we could remove that piece and still have a complete puzzle. When in fact, without the light, we are darkness. And if we have the light, we are light. It becomes a consuming part of who we are. Every attribute, every function, everything about who I am, when I was darkness was consumed by sin completely. But now that I am in light, now that I am a Christian, I am light in the Lord. And Paul's not crazy to write this, is he? Because what did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. No one puts a basket over a lamp. Could you imagine doing that, right? Um, or maybe you have a family member who's the, the addict to turning lights off to save electricity. Except they turn it off when you're in the middle of doing something. You know, you're sitting in the room, they didn't realize you were there, so they turn the light off and you're like, well, okay, that's cool. I guess I'm done. No, 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 no. It's not that way. So look, we are the light of the world. We are light in the Lord. We, when we are in the Lord, we are are consumed by light. It's our new identity. If you will, my name was darkness. Now my name is light. And then Paul goes even further and says, live as children of light, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Now I skipped nine because nine is going to contribute to this idea of a child of the light tests what's pleasing to the Lord. A child of the light consistently wants to make sure that whatever they're doing is pleasing to the Lord. And then he explains, for the fruit of light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Whatever we do must be consumed by, this is the standard that I judge things by. I judge it by um, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness being God's goodness. Righteousness being Christ's righteousness. Truth being the truth of Scripture, the truth of what Christ has done on the cross, the truth of the gospel that God is redeeming us. Everything we do as we test things as children of the light is done by that standard. Those are our benchmarks. But we forget as children of the light, and we often like to create our own light, don't we? Our own parameters, our own justification of what is righteous and what is not. We like to judge by our own heart, which was once completely consumed by wickedness, sin, and my own vile. We are to judge everything based on Christ's standard. So when we say, as children of light, testing everything for what is pleasing to the Lord, we test it by the Lord's standard, not ours. This is why in the book of Matthew, when, it talked, when, when Jesus says... Um, do not judge or you will be judged. He then goes in on kind of a, a long tirade of God's going to judge. It's not that we aren't meant to judge anything. It's that we're meant to judge everything by God's standard. Everything falls under God's feet. Everything falls under Christ's authority, not mine. This is not my world. Not my gospel, not my church, not my anything. It belongs to God. So everything gets filtered through God and His standard. 
In 11, we're told, don't participate in fruitless work, or in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead, expose them. Well, that just got nasty. Because we as Americans, right, we talk, I talked earlier about that individualism, and we like the fact that we can have our public life, and then we can go home and what? Shut the door. In Texas, we use this illustration that every house in Texas has a gate. If you want to get in the gate business, Texas is not the place to go because they all already have gates. Everybody's got a gate. And if you really want to do life right, you have a gate inside of your gate. Got to have the double gate life, right? And the idea of a gate, what does a gate do? Yes, it keeps things in, but it also keeps things out. It's a barrier. It's a wall which stops things from crossing over. And we as, uh, we as people, we as Western Americans, that's we're in, West, or we're in the Western Hemisphere here in America, right? I got that right, right? I know where I am. We are so individualistic that we create these gates in our lives that I live a life out in the light, and then I can have my own cavern, my own private sphere in which I am not supposed to have anything exposed. This is my private spot. You can say whatever you want about my public life, but have nothing to do with my private. We like to have these two different worlds. And now we have a third world with social media. Which, that's a terrifying world, guys. I don't even have social media anymore, so when the darkness that, go, that we participate in goes on there, makes it w- its way into the real world, oh my goodness. The vile things that we are capable of. But we like to keep these worlds separate, and we like to have worlds that we can leave hidden, don't we? Each one of us has our little cave. Each one of us has a place that we don't want God to find. And here Paul says, don't participate in the fruitlessness. Don't participate in the darkness. Don't seek darkness. Don't harbor it, but expose it. And the first place we expose it is our own hearts. And we say, my, I have some darkness. God, search me and find me. I need you, God, to free me from my sin. This is why there's no such thing as a Christian self-help book. That's the greatest oxymoron in Christianity, is the self-help section. I can't help myself. I can't do anything for myself. The best I can do is go find more sin. Again, I got the resume. I can find me some darkness. I got you that. You want to know where it is? I got it. I can be your sin dealer. I can't help me. I need God to search me. And then we walk together. This is the we, and we walk together. But we do so by God's standard, not my own. I don't like it is not enough of a reason. The righteousness, goodness, and truth of Christ, the calling of which He calls us to live, the lifestyle that He commands, that's the standard. And so we search our we, uh, we ask God to search our hearts and we, we seek the good of one another and we don't participate in the darkness and we expose the sin of our hearts. For it is shameful even to mention what is done, or what is done by them in secret. Paul says we should be horrified when we align ourselves with darkness. We as Christians should be horrified when we become agents of darkness. You can only serve one master. And your flesh will always want to serve sin. So be horrified by your own sin. Horrified by what sin does in our world. Horrified by the depths of which we can reach. And be characterized by light instead. In 13 he says, everything exposed by light is made visible. And then 14 is like the ultimate duh statement of the book. This is the one that you go, All right, Paul, that was brilliant. 13, he says, everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is, guess what? Light. Wow, Paul. Wow. You mean light is what makes things visible? So we should use light to make it visible? Yes, and I think Paul says it that bluntly because we try everything else. We try everything else. In our diets, we try substitutes all the time, right? If you want less sugar, what do you use? One of the 18,000 different things you can sweeten it with. 
But in the end, nothing's going to make that sweet tea quite the same as about a thousand gallons of sugar per cup. Nothing's quite the same, but we substitute it with everything else. Which one is it? There's one of them that bubbles at the top, and you get a foam on the top of your tea. That ain't sweet tea, right? That's foam. That's a latte. Those are two different drinks. Now, just in case you think that Paul is coming up with all this on his own, he makes sure that we know he's not. He has a quote here. Get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, this is not a direct quote from a verse. It's actually kind of a a combination of several verses from Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet whose job was to expose the sin of the people. He was to be light to a nation of darkness. This is some of the things they says. These are some of the verses that probably go into what Paul is saying. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on the living in the land of darkness. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For you will be covered in the morning dew, and the earth will bring out the departed spirits. So that was the resurrection. Isaiah 52, 1. Wake up, wake up. Put on your strength, Zion. Put on your garments. Get up, Zion. Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer enter you. You will be made holy. And then Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, 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 shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines over who? Over you. That we as God's people are called to be a people of the light. We are called to rise up. We are called to seek the Lord. And why? Get up, sleeper. Rise up from the dead. Get out of your sin. Leave it, right? Why? Because Christ will shine on you. The sleeper is the one who still seeks darkness. Get up. Get up. Quit sleeping in the dark. Quit hiding in the dark. Get up and allow Christ to shine on you. Leave your anger, leave your rage, leave your lying, leave all of it, leave your sin, leave your pride, leave it. Get up, and Christ will shine on you. Now in verse 15, he continues on with uh, something of a, a warning here. Pay careful attention then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. And we, we tend to like, uh, I, I don't know if it's because of, um, I don't know if it's because of culture, I don't, know if it, I don't know what the reason is, but we tend to focus on that last phrase, right? Because the days are evil and we like to have our little sit around, gripe about the news fest and say, oh man, the world's never been this bad. Oh man, the days are evil. Oh man, oh man, oh. Have you read the account of Noah? God was so fed up with the world in the days of Noah that he came to a man and said, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to restart the whole thing and spare eight of you. Have you read Sodom and Gomorrah? God was so, that he found that city so despicable that he destroyed an entire region. And when Lot's wife simply looked back, he turned her into a pillar of salt. Have you read what the Canaanites did? I will say that the world has always been horrible. And the days have always been evil. So let's not focus on that last bit. Let's actually focus on what's above it. Let's focus on the entire message, which is this. Pay careful attention how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Remember that in Corinthians, we find out that the wisdom of God is what? The cross. The wisdom of God is not Confucius statements. The wisdom of God is not witty things that you can post on social media. The wisdom of God is not coffee cup sayings. The wisdom of God is a crucified Messiah. A Jesus who died for our sin. And he says, live not as anti-crucified Christ people, but live as people who pursue a crucified Jesus. 
Live as wise people. Live as those who have the skill to navigate life. And that skill is knowing the gospel, knowing Jesus. And make the most of the time. I think make the most of the time is not live life to the fullest right now. I think most of the time seems to be live wisely. And let the fruit of that wise living come out. Because we only got so much time. I think the, that phrase there of because the time is evil is not to tell you the world is icky, therefore be good. I think what it's actually supposed to invoke in you is the days are evil and the Lord's coming back. And we don't know when he's coming back. This invokes all the images of the good managers, right? And the bad managers in Jesus' parables where the master goes away and they have no idea when the master will come back. And be found working. Don't be found sleeping. Don't be found being lazy. Don't be found in your sin. Be found being wise. Following Christ. Seeking His good, His cross. And he says, so don't be foolish, but understand what the, will, or what the Lord's will is. The Lord's will is that we live like His Son. I know that I've said that every week. But I got nothing else for you. What more could you want? God says, come be like my son. Come live like my son. I want you to live like my son. No matter how many times he tells us, we run from that. So we must know what the Lord's will is. And then he says something interesting in verse 18. And don't get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, here, we could go on this, uh, this journey about drinking. But I want to approach this passage not as a drinking passage, but as what the passage is pointing us to. He says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless living. And that's ultimately where we're heading, is towards this reckless living. What you are filled with will come out. What you are filled with will come out. And so he says, what he's trying to do is paint an image as contradictory to one another as he can. He says, don't be the drunk stumbling, living recklessly. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You can fill yourself with the world, or you can fill yourself with God's Spirit. One will lead to reckless living. One will lead away from Christ. One will lead to awful things. The other will lead to our Father. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with God's Spirit. And what, is it, what happens when you're filled with the Spirit? When you're drunk with wine, you're filled with reckless living. But when you're filled with the Spirit, you begin speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Remember earlier we talked about words that are not pointed towards grace or pointed away from the Lord. When you are filled with the, your, with the Spirit, your words will, point, will always point people back to the Lord. They will always point people back to the Lord. Did you notice that every kind of, uh, of expression there was something that points you back to the Lord? Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Now, I'm not asking you when we pass one another in the hall, you're not going to see Michael and I pass in the hall and begin singing songs to the Lord, and that's all the only way we have to talk. If you catch us doing that, one of us went nuts and it wasn't Michael. Probably me, right? But notice that the character of every word we use will ultimately point back to the Lord. Our desire and our hunger will be for the Lord. Our thirst will be for the Lord. Our desire with other people will be that they know the Lord. Everything we say will be consumed by that. We will be that strange person. But is that strange person who always talks about the Lord really strange? Or are they actually what we were designed to be from the beginning? Is it strange that a Christian would talk about their Christ? Or is it strange that a Christian would ignore their Christ? It can only be one. 
So every word we have, we'll be lifting up the Lord. And everything that we say will be from giving thanks for everything. To who? God the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are not pointing one another to the Lord by the love of Christ, we are doing something hostile to the gospel. Hostile to God. And he will have his way. Because just as it said in our very first verse, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. So here's the question we're left with. Just like every week, our invitation is this. Christian, do you find yourself in darkness? Are you holding on to a little bit of darkness? A little bit of leaven goes a long way in a loaf. Have you ever made bread? You don't put three cups of yeast in bread. If you do, you get an abomination. You put just a little bit. So all it takes is a little bit, and that's the difference between, between pita bread and a beautiful loaf. Are you holding on to darkness? Do you have your little cave in the background? If so, shine Christ's light on it. Say, Christ, I let go of control. I need you to expose my darkness. I need you to get rid of my gossip. I need you to get rid of it. I need you to rip my anger from my heart. I need you to be violent with me, God. Don't show mercy to my sin. But show me how you conquer my sin. So for the Christian, this is a time where you can respond and you can flee from your sin. Don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. I'm begging you, don't go back to your sin. For those who aren't a Christian, right, if you have never confessed Jesus as your Lord, if you have never submitted your life to Him, this is an open invitation for you to come and hear about who He is. That the gospel is for you. The gospel is that you are in your sin. You are an enemy of God, and ultimately that means that His wrath is coming for you. But if you will repent, if you will turn away from your sin, if you will turn to His light and literally go to the light, if you will run to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. I believe in what you did on the cross. And I repent of my sin and I have faith in you. If you will follow Jesus in this way, he will give you eternal life. He will give you a life of light. You will be free from your darkness, free from that pain, finally. I'll be up here in front if you want to talk about what that means to follow Jesus. Or you can turn to any Christian in the room. Any Christian in the room would love to tell you what it means to be a child of the light. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for the good work you do in our lives, that you free us from our sin, that you free us in a way that we could never do for ourselves. I ask that during this time, you would convict our hearts, that you would open our eyes to our sin, and that you would help us to flee from it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You all can stand at the